Hello and welcome to the CAPUS International Science Festival. We are delighted to welcome you tonight to this evening's event, Genology, the Science of Gin. I'm Ian Bakey, uh, Science 03 Chairman. Here with me tonight is Nicka McLeod, the Festival Administrator that's put this fantastic festival together, and Claire Gallagher, one of our committee members. Hello, Claire. And also joining us um, from Dunnett Bay Distillers is Martin Murray. Hi, Martin. Hello. Hi. Before we begin, I'll just uh, mention that um, Nicholas put together an activity book from the Science Festival containing puzzles uh, and games and competition. Um, normally, we have over a thousand entrants to our primary school competition. We couldn't run it this year. So this uh, book is available to download. We've already had it at, um, uh, at Liddell's and Tesco's and Wick and Thurshall, but it might, they might already have gone. It's free of charge for the download, so please uh, have a look at it if you're interested. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. At the bottom of your screen, there's a chat box and a question and answer. So uh, if you would use the question and answer to ask questions to Martin, when he's finished his presentation, Claire and I will uh, ask questions that you put together. And we're also looking for comments from anybody about how you think of our virtual science festival, which is our first is going. And also, if you want to give Martin any feedback on the talk tonight, uh, you're very welcome to use that uh, question and answer uh, function. Um, the event has been recorded, but your screens are not. Uh, this has been a popular event, a very popular event. So please direct all comments through the Q&A. Uh, we'll answer as many as we can. As an audience, you can upvote questions. So if there's a question no one, somebody else has asked and you're keen to your answer, then give it a thumbs up and it moves it up the list. Uh, established in 2014 in Caithness, Dunnett Bay Distillers has grown to be a recognised worldwide for their award-winning Scottish spirits. And at the same time, they've shown that they care about their local community and the advancement of Caithness as a region through their continued development of the business and support of our fest of events such as this festival. Martin has been a great speaker in the past, and I'm sure he will be tonight. But thank you very much for that, Martin. Um, we're de delighted to welcome owner and master distiller Martin Murray this evening to talk about the distilling process, how they select the botanicals for their spirits. Martin will take us through our guided tasting session for you, you for some of you who are lucky enough to have the tasters. Uh, and if you've gotten your hands on these, it's going to be an interesting night. And the other thing to celebrate is Mark told me that he's just released Citrus Coastal Gin. Uh, so I, I believe already, what, 300 bottles have been sold and it's just released. So the, your website is busy taking orders for uh, Citrus Coastal Gin, is that right? Yeah, that's right. It's a busy night for Claire at home. <laughs> okay, I, I hope it's a very busy night. We're so looking forward to this presentation tonight. So over to you, Martin. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Ian. We're delighted to be here uh, doing a talk for the Science Festival. As a family based in Caithness, we've loved the last few years and enjoyed uh, this year very much. Uh, we've enjoyed being able to catch up on some of the shows, uh, some of the talks. And if you've not seen it, we recommend the meteors and the solar system. It was fantastic. Um, tonight, um, I'm not going to be talking about the solar system. I'm going to be talking about something I know a little bit more about, uh, which is making gin in the north of Scotland. Um, I am uh, the co-founder of Dunnett Bay Distillers with my wife, Claire. We started in 2014 um, with a goal of creating two jobs, one for me and one for Claire. Um, if you fast forward seven years, we've created 11 jobs and we have exported to 24 countries now. So all the way to Japan, Argentina, New Zealand, um, and then a little bit closer to home, Ireland, England, Northern Ireland, you know, all our home patch. So tonight I'm going to give you um, a talk um, that talks you through how to do a tasting because I'm conscious that some people haven't done a gin tasting before. So we'll talk to you about how you do a gin tasting, what's involved. Then we'll get into the fun part. We'll do a tasting. We'll start with Rock Rose Gin. And um, then we'll move on to our spring edition. Uh, sorry, the old Tom. Then the spring edition. And then finally, there's a bit of a curveball. We're doing Holy Grass in a gin tasting. So Holy Grass Vodka. And... Um, 
in a minute, amongst that, I'll try and throw in some of the bits that we know, um, the science facts we know about tastings, and some snippets about what we've learned from actual hands-on experience when we taste on the still and when we ta do tastings with customers. Um, so yeah, that's it. So let's get cracking. Um, how do you do a tasting? Um, sounds very simple. You just put it in your mouth and you taste it and that's it. It's all, all good. Well, actually, you know, there's a bit more to it than that. Um, we start off very simply by looking at the spirit. So when you look at gin, it should be clear like a vodka. However, there are oils in there from all the berries and botanicals. So when it's neat, you may notice some oils swirling in the gin. Take a look at the products tonight. And as we go through them, you will see the different colors. Now, when you've seen them on their own, they look clear, but hold them up next to each other and you will get the chance to see a slight variation between the products. The other thing about appearance is it can potentially tell you that there's something wrong with it. You know, um, if it just doesn't look right, if there's some particles in there that haven't been filtered out, you want to check for that. Um, also, we've had some fun aging gin in casks. So you, if you age in a cask or like a sherry cask, you're going to pick up some of the colours of the sherry cask. So with the appearance it can be very um, enjoyable and interesting too when you're looking at cask aged gins. Um, the next part is the nosing. So you have all these lovely receptors that are linked to your brain that can tell you all these flavour compounds without it even touching your lips. Some people swirl the glass very vigorously to try and release particles. That actually flashes off more alcohol than flavour. So you don't want to do that. Um, you want to do it very slowly. You want to build a bit of a swirl and then try to pick out some of the nuances in the gin. My job as a distiller, um, the same as Hannah and Kevin, who both work here as distillers, is to try and balance the gin, try and give it some complexity, make sure that um, there's nothing there that's uh, dragging down the other flavours um, or dominating the juniper. We want something that's very traditional in style, juniper-led, but then with these different nuances of flavours, these can come from roots, they can come from bark, they can come from floral ingredients, they can come from herbs, they can come from citrus peels, berries. There are so many things that you can do with gin. And tonight we've got a showcase of different botanicals and different um, methodologies on making gin that we can talk about. So that's the nose. The next part is the palate. So I always say the first step, you discount. The first step is really about acclimatizing your mouth to the spirit. You know, if we were doing a Navy strength tasting, we'd be starting with 57% ABV. And that is a shock to the system um, at that strength. But once you've had the first sip of Navy strength, your mouth has acclimatized, that alcohol heat starts to pass. The second sip is when you pick the flavors out. And you're not gonna pick everything out on your first sip, that's just not practical. So you get a lot of sips to enjoy and to pick out the different flavors. So when I'm sipping gin, I'm firstly trying to determine how much juniper's in there. Is it really powerful juniper that's in there? Or is it more like light and delicate juniper? That can sometimes tell me actually how the gin was made. Um, and then I'm looking for the additional layers in there. The way we make our spirits here is very much like building blocks that we layer on top of each other. So we start with the juniper berries and then we layer on top of that the kind of the bark. So uh, angelica root, rose root, orris root. And build them in as your first building blocks. Then we layer citrus on top, so orange peel, lemon peel. Finally, well, not finally, second last step, we'll add some spice in there. So we'll put in some cinnamon, some grains of paradise, some cassia bark. On top of that, we'll then add things like the floral notes from rhodiola rosea. We'll add um, some more um, of the kind of lighter notes that you would pick out from berries, um, like blueberries, blackberries, rowan berries. And all of this builds a layering profile that as you have it on the palate starts to come through. The interesting thing when you're tasting is um, at different temperatures, you will pick out different flavors. So if your gin is chilled in the fridge, it will suppress flavors and it will take a while for it to come out. So as it warms up, you'll start to flash off more of the kind of higher volatile compounds and they'll start to come to the fore. A good way to see this is when you're drinking rock roses to have it at normal room temperature, warm it up a bit and then sip it again. And you'll start to taste some of these blueberries, some of the verbena coming through. So that's very, very interesting. And then when you've done this, you've 
had a look at the drink, you nosed it, you tasted it, you then kind of make your final assessment. Is it balanced? What was the distiller trying to do? What do you pick out? Um, everybody's tastes different. So you could be sitting at a table with eight people and all pick out individual botanicals that are in the gin, but each other can't taste. Um, so that last part is very important, is to take time to think, maybe write notes, um, have a look at the gin flavour wheel and try and pinpoint where you can pick out different ingredients and different profiles in the gin. I'm ready for a gin now. So <laughs> let's do our first tasting. Um, I know there's um, 60 packs that um, some of you have been very lucky to have. Um, we're going to start with Rock Rose Gin. Take your Rock Rose Gin sample. If you have a whiskey snifter glass, this is a good shape because you have this wider base, narrower top. It concentrates the volatile um, flavours, compounds that come out. So you're able then to kind of get uh, a better way to identify it. If you use a wider mouth, it starts to spread out and it's not as concentrated. So that's why they use it in whiskey. Um, I use something similar, but it's a bit more um, for gin. This one here. So again, a wider base, narrower top. I warm the spread, just bring it so Look at the color, rock rose is clear. We don't do anything after we distill a rock rose. There's nothing there that brings any color to the gin. It's not blended, it's not matured. There's no compounding done, it's not sweetened. So this gin is untouched and clear. So you can see that quite easily in the glass. Now for the nose. You can tell it's gin straight away, or you should be able to. That's the key part of the first tasting. Have you got the right drink? You can pick up juniper from there straight away. That's your first note that comes off. We use about six kilograms of juniper in each batch. Then you're starting to get some of the more citrusy profiles. So we've got lemon verbena in there and orange peel. They're starting to come out. You notice that there's none of these spice notes at all in the nose. It's all the lighter floral citrus notes. Now for the taste. Now this is neat. So the first taste, allow it to coat your mouth. Does it feel oily? Does it feel clean? Um, is there anything in there that you can identify that makes it have that mouth feel? Um, sometimes sweetened gins can taste a bit more um, the more it tastes sweet, but it can coat your tongue more. Um, the more sugar, the more it coats. Compare notes, start to think, what's that first sip starting to release? So I start to feel that warmth passing. As the warmth passes, you're starting to pick out a little bit more I still get more of the citrus notes early on with this gin. I think on the second set, you'll start to see the spice and the berries coming through. So there, when you're doing this second set, you're starting to taste a bit more sweetness in the gin. There's a bit more of that rose coming through. It's a bit more floral now. Um, as you're starting to taste, you're identifying more and more flavor compounds in there. One of the things I like about Rock Rose Gin is the finish is more like a lemon sherbet finish. Um, and it seems to be late that it arrives. So I always find that when I'm looking for it, I don't get it. And then just a few seconds later, then it comes. There's that lemon sherbet finish. See if you can pick that out. See if you can pick out the other ingredients. We've got 18 ingredients in here, two types of juniper. Um, and then we've got things like angelica root, licorice root, orris root, rose root, orange peel, um, lemon verbena, rowan berries, hawthorn berries, um, sea buckthorn berries, cinnamon, cassia, licorice, um, and, and a couple of others which escape me right now. But you should be able to pick out some of those, licorice especially, cassia and cinnamon. Some people will be able to pick those out because they are um, quite easily identifiable uh, flavours. Now you see on, on that taste, I'm picking out a little bit more of the spice now. Because I've tuned into the other flavours and they're starting to pick up the flavours that I've missed in the other tastings. It's very interesting. Um, I'm not trying to warm the glass, you know, I'm holding the stem, but if I wanted to, I could hold it like that, bring a bit of heat into the, into the plate. Um, if you want to have a little bit of fun um, experimenting with temperature, take the gin out of the glass, put some uh, hot water in it, maybe about 40, 50 degrees, 
let it warm the glass up, tip the water out, put the gin back in. Then lots of things start to flash off that weren't flashing off at room temperature. Taste it again, taste it side by side, and you'll start to realize that temperature had a big impact on what you're tasting. Now, to finish the tasting, we'd always go with um, a building up a perfect serve. So because your nose plays such an important part in your tasting of the product, your garnish dictates really what your first impression of the gin is. Now we garnish our gin in two ways. First, we'll garnish it with rosemary, which is my way. I love toasted rosemary in the drink. It brings a smokiness to the nose so that when you taste the gin, it almost has a sweetness behind it against that smoky backdrop. Um, Claire prefers it with orange peel, so it's very fresh, very citrusy. It's like a summer's day drink, um, very easy to enjoy. Um, to build the perfect serve, tonic um, is your first go-to. So um, add your tonic in. I start at a two-to-one ratio. I would always suggest you start at a two-to-one ratio because that allows you to see if it's at the right strength for you. If you do it too weak, it's kind of difficult. You have to then go back and add some more gin in. I will start two to one. So two parts tonic to one part gin and then lengthen the drink until you get the right balance. Clear is three to one and two to one. You may be in between, you may be slightly longer, but build that drink up, add some ice, add your garnish, and then you have the perfect serve. And you'll notice that when you taste the perfect serve against the neat gin, it's different because the garnish has brought aromas to your nose, which is then unlocking more of this different flavour complexities. Now you can garnish a gin um, for different reasons. You can garnish it because you have a certain garnish that you love, or you can garnish it to draw out flavours of the gin. So if you want to draw out some of the berries of rock rose, garnish it with blueberries. If you want to drink, gar uh, get more spice out of it, you can use a chilli. Um, you could use something like Vietnamese coriander that would draw out a bit of the spice. And then that would give you a very different perfect serve. I always find it interesting to taste rock rose side by side, get the perfect serve with rosemary, get the perfect serve with orange, taste them side by side, and then compare. And you'll find that they're almost like different drinks. Um, and it's worth doing. Now, before we skip to the next drink, I'll tell you a little bit about the process. So this is rock rose process in your background here. It's a vapour infusion still that we use here. Um, Elizabeth is just over this shoulder. Uh, she's made all of her gin for us uh, since we started. Um, we have Margaret there that has been used for experimental projects and also for doing our coastal edition. Now, the pot that you can see contains the alcohol and water, 60% ABV. We boil it up, we make this nice alcohol vapor that comes out over the top, down into the basket. And in the basket, you can see these berries and botanicals. We layer them, we always layer them the same way because we trust the way the product comes out and we don't want to tinker and change it. Um, so typically we'll layer the berries first because they um, don't fall through the holes in the basket. Then we'll add coriander and all the other ingredients and then some juniper at the top. Um, the gin vapor then comes through into the condenser, it's cooled into the gin safe and into the tank. We start distilling, it comes off about 86%. We run it all the way down to about 75% ABV. Now, in the glass pot that you can see behind me, we do three things. We measure temperature, alcohol strength, and taste. And our distillers will taste the spirit neat at that strength. Um, because we're used to it, we can identify flavor compounds at that strength. Um, and then we'll put it in a tank, we'll dilute it down, let the gin rest, and then we'll bottle it. And that's the process for what goes. It's what we call a vapor-infused gin London dry style. Now, London dry style means that you distill it and you don't add anything to it at the end um, other than water, which is what we do here. You could also call it a one-shot gin, which means we distill it in one pass. We don't do a second distillation or a third distillation. We do a one-pass vapor infusion gin. Quite a, a lot of terminology, and I'm going to add some more to it now with our next tasting. Um, the next one we're going to do is our Old Tom. Pink grape for Old Tom. We peel 30 organic pink grapefruits to make this addition. Um, and we um, put them in the vapor infusion pot. We distill them um, with the rest of the botanicals. But here's the difference. At the end, we will sweeten the gin with muscovado sugar. So if you look at the appearance of this gin against next to rock rose, there is a slight, slight, slight tinge. And that's because muscovado sugar has that um, brown color. And when we 
dilute it down, it, it mixes in. And when we look at it in the tank, we can see it against a stainless steel tank as being really quite col uh, concentrated in colour. But then when we bottle it, you don't really notice it. Um, but it's worth comparing side by side because you will see it. Now, this gin is different because we've talked about adding this sweetness. The reason we add the sweetness to this gin is not because we want it to be sugary, it's because we found that it drew out the best in the pink grapefruit peel. Um, we add about 0.1 grams of muscadado sugar per bottle. Um, and what you'll get when you nose this, come on, pink grapefruit all the way. It's that lovely light citrus aroma coming off first. And then you get the juniper behind it. Pink grapefruit has to be one of my favourite smells in the distillery. And we've got that kilos of pink grapefruit peel and we're putting it into the still. It's so fresh and so light. So getting all the citrus, you're getting that juniper at the, in there as well, but it's very much more complex in the front than Rock Rose. Rock Rose is very junipery and Old Tom is very pink grapefruit mixed with juniper as a front. You can taste that little tinge of sugar now as well coming through. It's a sweetness coming through in the second sip. This drink I always call summer in a glass because when you start to add tonic to it, it starts to open up and become really refreshing. So you see that this is very citrus profile driven. You know, there's none of the spice coming through at the floor. You're getting some of the sort of treacle notes from the muscovado sugar. Very much still a London dry gin. Eh, sorry, sorry, not London dry, a classic gin. Um, but that little bit of sweetness and citrus really changes the drink. Now, if you want to add tonic to it, um, I would do three to one. If you want to go straight to the perfect serve, but you can do two to one on this. Now, this is really interesting. When you've added that tonic, it's opened up a lot more. In whiskey, um, a lot of connoisseurs will add drops of water to open up the whiskey. Tonic has a similar effect to You can use water with pink grapefruit. Uh, old Tom and it will open up but when you add the tonic to that you'll notice that it's become really citrusy and refreshing. Very different. If you've got your rock rose sitting next to it go back taste back taste and you'll see the differences side by side. I should add that um, normally as a palate cleanser you will use things like bread um, because it's a um, very neutral flavour and it soaks and is able to uh, take the flavours out so you're ready for your next drink. Um, but you can use water just to give it a, a, a clean, a clear through and ready for the second tasting. Now, um, one thing I learned was uh, about taste buds. You always hear about dogs having such great noses. And uh, we learned that um, humans have around about 2,000 to 10,000 uh, taste buds on average. You do get people that have more and they're classed as super tasters. Um, th these are one in four. So if you're picky about food or better flavors are really off putting, you're probably a super taster. You have these additional taste buds. Um, I didn't know it until tonight, but chickens only have 27 taste buds and catfish have nearly 200,000. Uh, and that's because catfish have to hunt in the dark at the bottom of the sea in muddy environments. So they use the, um, the taste buds on their whiskers to be able to hunt. Um, it's really interesting when you look into these things. Um, dogs, again, fantastic number of um, taste buds and can pick up smells. That's why they're used um, to, to do drug, drug searches and these kind of things. Um, if you're super tasty, you're very lucky. Um, some of the super tastiers in the whiskey world have their noses insured for over a million pounds. Um, and it's, it's a, a really a great thing to have. You know, you can, you can identify things that other people can't pick out. Now, we go on to our third tasting and we're getting a bit more scientific now. So we're using the spring edition. Um, spring edition, clear. Same as rock rose, very clear. Um, we are using the rock rose gin distillation process that I outlined in the background. Um, however, we're being a little bit naughty. We're distilling gorse in a vacuum still. So we take fresh gorse, which has a lovely coconut aroma when you're walking through the forest, and we're distilling it around about 20 to 30 degrees C in our vacuum still. 
Now, the reason we distill at such a low temperature in a vacuum is because there's no heat. Heat, when you heat course, it starts to break down and give you stewed flavors. When you do it in a vacuum still, you capture so much of that light floral note. Now, for the spring edition, we also use other local ingredients. We use dandelion and colts for it. Now, uh, dandelion is not the um, most popular botanical to use for gin. When you look at it, it's not, not as attractive as a rose. Um, but dandelion's got great, great properties. We use the stems and they bring like a licorice note to the, um, to the gin. Some people use the root um, and it's similar to orris root. Some people use the root as a coffee um, substitute. Um, we're using the dandelion stems to bring uh, this licorice flavor to the gin. We'll hopefully pick it out. The other local ingredient that we're using is colt's foot. Colt's foot was used in confectionery and it's quite sweet. Um, we use it in this to make a sweet floral gin. So you're getting to taste a gin that is a compounded gin using a vacuum distillate. So let's see if we can pick out those floral notes. We've already identified that it's um, clear, it's not been compounded, no, ad no additional um, sort of compounding of, or maceration has taken place post distillation. Different again, so you're starting to smell sweetness and floral notes from this, but a different style. I pick up Colt's foot in about the um, juniper straight away. Colt's foot's a very unique sweetness, I find. If you get to see them in, when you're out walking, they're around right now, they're like baby dandelions. Have a smell of what's inside the stem and it's sweet, very sweet. Mm. So you're picking up more of those kind of greener herbal notes in this. You can pick up the dandelion quite early in this. Um, I get the juniper all the way with this. Compared to pink grapefruit, you're seeing that there's not the same citrus front on it at all. There's no citrus front. Then you get that little wax of coconut floralness. It's very, very subtle to pick out. When we garnish this drink, we garnish it with either um, gorse if it's in season, um, or you could use lime or coriander. They both work really well with this. I wish you were all here in front of me to tell me what you're tasting. <laughs> um, so this is our first of our seasonal additions. We do three others that take you around the gin flavor wheel. We've got the summer edition, which is using herbal citrus ingredients. So we use things like pineapple sage, lemon thyme, lime and verbena. Um, and they're fantastic uh, ingredients that go here in our garden and our geodome. Uh, then we move to the autumn edition, which is berries and spice, blueberries, blackberries um, and raspberries with nasturtium flowers and Vietnamese coriander from our geodome. It's sweet with a little bit of spice. And then the final one is our winter edition, which is almost like uh, juniper, really juniper led, but we're a bit naughty. We use the uh, spruce tips from the trees in Dunnett Forest. Um, these contain pinene, which is the same chemical compound that, or flavour compound that you'll find in juniper. So we make a juniper-led gin using juniper, but a lot of spruce. We chop the spruce tips off, we freeze them, and we use them um, in our still like we do with the others. So go ahead and build your um, uh, gin and tonic with this. Um, again, go two to one or three to one. You'll kind of know your ratio by now. You can build up from two to one, like I suggested, or uh, go straight to it. Very different again, compare that to pink grapefruit, to rock rose, very different style of gin and tonic altogether. Now I always like at this point, if I'm at home, to jump back and forth, go between the three, get the different taste now, because when you do the tasting and move progressively through, it's difficult to see the big step change that's happened. So if you go back to Pink Grapefruit now, you can see there's been a big step change between the drinks. Now we're gonna have a bit of fun. My favorite product that we've developed, um, Holy Grass Vodka. Um, I love the story. Um, it was discovered by a botanist, self-taught botanist, uh, here in Thurso in the early 1800s. He was a baker in the early hours of the morning and then finished his baking, 
and his housekeeper sold um, the things that he baked and he went off looking for different botanicals. Now, when we were doing our recipe development for Rock Rose, I fell in love with Holy Grass, absolutely loved the story, loved the botanical, but just didn't work in a gin because either Holy Grass was dominating the gin or Juniper was suffocating the Holy Grass. So I parked it and wanted to give it a spirit that did it justice. So um, we created Holy Grass Vodka. Um, it's the UK's first and only grass vodka. Um, Holy Grass was first discovered growing up here on Thurza River. We now grow Holy Grass in our garden and we're hoping to do a seed transplant from Thurza River to our garden so that we can create a seed bank, but also use the original Holy Grass in this uh, vodka. We use um, a little bit of black isle apples and apple juice. We use a little touch of cinnamon. Now, Holy Grass is the same grass as bison grass and bison grass is used to make Zubrovka or bison grass vodka as it's known in Poland. We, um, we use the same style of botanic or same botanical as grass, but we use our own methodology and we've added these additional botanicals because I felt that Zubrovka didn't have a middle or a heart and it didn't have a finish. So you'll see with Holy Grass, this drink has a front, heart and a finish. Um, and whilst it's a vodka, because we're using botanicals, it's uh, almost like a hybrid between a vodka, a plain vodka and a gin. It's in that kind of um, botanical space. So I'll tell you how we make this in a minute. But let's have a look at the color. You should be able to see a tinge of green from the grass, very, very light. Have a look at it against your gin, have a look at it against a glass of water and you should see a small light tinge. That's deliberate, it's just the way we make it. So when I was designing Holy Grass Vodka, I tried to translate how it was made in Poland. I tried using Google Translate, tried using Polish text, and I gave up. I thought, what's the fun in that? Why don't we just do it ourselves, just do it from scratch? So with Hannah, we developed different methodologies, different ways of making it, and then we honed in on our favorite taste profile. And this is the result. Um, we compound with the grass at the end, um, and we soak the grass in the basket with apple juice and a little touch of cinnamon. So let's start. Holy grass is very much like vanilla on the front. And what vanilla does is it tricks your brain into thinking it's sweet. Um, it is sweet because of the apple juice, but your brain thinks it's sweeter than it actually is. And that can happen. They did experiments with ham. If you take ham and smell ham before you drink something, you'll think the drink is salty. It's one of these tricks that happen. So vanilla and ham do this to your to your, to your brain, it's a sort of trick of, of your taste. But with this, the vanilla is coming from the grass. Now let's go for the taste. Okay. So your mouth acclimatizing to the change from gin to vodka. You can get that grass note all the way through it. It's very, um, it reminds me of kind of almost like cut grass on a hot day, um, a really nice, uh, grass smell. On the second taste, I think we'll pick up the apples. Mm. On the front there, you're starting to pick up the apples. Now try and pick out the cinnamon. Should be like a lingering cinnamon taste. Now, after you've had those sips and you've come through the tasting process, you'll start to taste that cinnamon. You'll probably get it on the third drink because now you've picked out the grass, you've picked out the apples. Now the cinnamon's gonna come through, through the spirit. There you go, you know, nice bit of warmth from it. It's very, almost like an apple pie actually, when you get that sweetness and that spice at the end, it's a very um, different style of drink. Now, this works really well as a what we call a done it donkey. So if you have it with ginger ale and uh, lime, it works really well like that. Our favorite way now is um, actually change. So last year it was apple juice and a blackberry. This year we've gone for tonic and um, apple. So please experiment. Um, you've got tonic in your packs, try it with tonic. And if you've got some apple, have a slice of apple with it. That sweetness from the apple changes the drink so much. Um, it just makes it a very different style of drink altogether. Holy Grass makes awesome um, espresso martinis. 
Uh, don't take my word for it, just try it. It's a vanilla flavour with a little bit of cinnamon in the uh, espresso martini really works together. So that's really a tasting profile through our spirit rings. We've got more that you can enjoy. If you come to our uh, tastings in the summer, we'll be doing our coffee holy grass that you can taste a coffee edition. And um, you, you'll get to taste some of the other additions that are on um, at that time. Um, and it's well worth a visit. We've just released one tonight that Ian kind of mentioned, which is Citrus Coastal. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how this works, um, which is we distilled this for the Craft Gin Club. Um, it won their best gin as voted by their members last year um, in, in December. So we decided then to do a launch to the general public. We had so many people wanting to taste it. Um, that we decided to release it. So tonight we've released it. Um, we use kelp um, from Caithness, from uh, Shore Seaweed Company. We use Hebridean salt, uh, and it's a licorice salt we use. So you've got this real kelp and salt, like this bracing sea air. And then we put lemon verbena from our, our geodome, and that brings a citrus profile to it. So hence the name Citrus Coastal. It is a totally different drink from these. So you want to have a taste of this, um, if you can get your hands on it and just try a salty gin. It's, there's nothing like it um, and it's well worth a try. Um, I'm delighted to have done a tasting tonight. Um, I hope there's some time for questions and um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks very much, Martin. That was a great presentation. Um, can I also thank Claire who's working in the background on the closed caption. She's been working hard too. So the first question, Martin, is from Beth. For a tasting, would you normally add tonic or not? Uh, so we've had many a debate about this over the years. And my now position on it is I think you should taste it the way you normally have your gin or the way you like to taste it. Um, so that means if you not normally have your gin with a tonic and that's the way you enjoy it, um, then then go ahead and do that. It's, it's, you sh you'll have that memory of the drink that you normally drink and you're able to make a quick comparison. As distillers, we always do it neat because we want to pick out the nuances without the interference of tonic. Thanks very much. Uh, Tommy would like to know, where do you get your juniper from? Uh, we have two types of juniper. So we have Bulgarian juniper, which contains more limonene. So it's a very um, citrusy style of juniper. And then we have Italian juniper, which has more piney, and it's your traditional warming juniper. We have uh, grown juniper and we, we work with the biodiversity group to plant it back on Dunnett Head, but I don't think we'll see a gin made with juniper from Caithness in this distillery when I'm a, while I'm still around. Okay, thanks. Um, Pat would like to know what garnishes would you serve with Old Tom? Oh yeah, sorry, I, sorry if I said that. I would always go pink grapefruit, I think. Um, it, it's one of those things that it really adds to it. So you could complement it by going with lemon peel, or orange peel, those separate profiles work with pink grapefruit. But when I'm having pink grapefruit, I just add pink grapefruit peel to it as well. It's just a great way to finish it. That's great. Uh, Nicholas would like to know, what capacity is your main still? How many bottles does it produce in one run? Main still is 500 litres, but it's a vapour infusion still. Um, so uh, we've used it to make concentrate before in the past, and it's made 8,000 bottles. But that was as an experiment. Um, what we always do is a vapor infusion run, and it makes just over 900 bottles per run. Thanks. Uh, uh, Nicholas' other question was, was presumably, presumably the trials are much smaller. smaller. Yeah, so we've got a 500 milliliter still here that we play with. So if you think about that, we go from 500 milliliters to 500 liters, and uh, that's how we scale up. Thanks. Uh, can, uh, can I ask the ask audience the if they want to give any feedback? feedback? to the uh, presentation, please do so. And any feedback to the organizers on the Science Festival, quite happy to get that to you. Uh, Pat would like to know, def well, she said, definitely coconut in the spring edition, is that right? Yep, absolutely, that's from the gorse. I, I think Pat is a, a fan. Um, <laughs> uh, Rona, you mentioned distilling again for a second or third time. How does this change the gin and why do you do it? Um, some people will distill two or three times to concentrate the flavours or to change the flavours. So um, it may be that when you distill the second time, you want to just do your 
your citrus run separate. So what you could do is you could distill juniper um, then distill your citrus in with the juniper run. So it's a way of building it up. Um, some people do it that way because um, they feel that they can get more control in layering. Um, we Our experience is that we can layer in the basket just as well. Um, it, it's, yeah, you'll find every distiller does things differently. Um, thanks, uh, Ali. As a non-gin drinker, you have inspired, inspired me to try. What do you suggest I start on? Oh, gosh. Um, so depends on where your flavour preferences are. So um, think about your favourite drink. And if it's something smoky or bitter, or um, try and work towards that side. So don't go for lemon if you like something that's maybe more smoky. Try something like a toasted rosemary garnish. So choose your garnish carefully um, if you're going to do it that way. But for me, um, start neat and then just experiment with mixers. We've had people who've enjoyed our gin with bitter lemon. We've had people who've enjoyed our gin with Coke. We've had people who've enjoyed our gin in coffee. So try to find a mixer that suits you um, and try it with gin. Um, you may be surprised. Great. I've got some feedback, Martin. Jill said, after a day of testing, I bet it's a fun place to work. Very nice presentation. Yvonne, really liked it. Thank you very much, Martin. Pat, um, fabulous presentation and actually loved the Holy Grass vodka. Yeah, we know that, Pat. Uh, Audrey, uh, very, really interesting pre presentation. Thank you. Mari, thank you. It's been very interesting. Look forward to tasting the Citrus Coastal. That's the one you launched today? Yep. Great. Um, and it's available on your website, I believe. I just checked. That's right, yeah. And Ben Ends have got stock and J. Mackay's and DM Fraser's too. Okay. And, and a shout out to Ben Ends who, uh, Nick, well, I think that's right. Ben Ends and uh, Thurso and Wick uh, facilitated all the tasters we got. So big, big shout out to uh, Murray and Elliot Bill Ends. Yeah, Thanks very cool. much. Uh, Murray Higginbottom, thank you. Very interesting. Look, look forward to the. Um, uh, Citrus Coastal. Stacy, thank you for a great presentation. I love the spring edition one, so that's doing very well. Um, Nicholas, uh, great presentation, lots of good botany. Beth loved it, and she just ordered the Citrus Coastal, so thumbs up to Beth. Uh, Callum says, uh, great event. Martin is a natural. I, I agree with that. <laughs> Helena, it really helped. Uh, to have you put a name on the flavours. As soon as you mentioned cinnamon, I realised, yes, that's what I was tasting, but I couldn't name it. Um, Susan, uh, thank you. Looking forward to doing a tour and tasting uh, sometime in the distillery. And Martin, before we, you started, I said that um, my work had a visit to your new uh, visitor centre, and it was absolutely fantastic. So I do um, uh, recommend that. Uh, Beth said, uh, really enjoyed the vodka, which she doesn't normally, so you've uh, got a convert. Ali, excellent science festival, good range of topics, and really knowledgeable and engaging presenters. Uh, going to think about my taste preferences. Thanks so much. Um, Martin, how did you come up with the idea of starting a business in Caithness? And if the last seven years has grown up to be such a, a fantastic, you know, a visitor center, the production you've got, the jobs you've generated, what's in your future? Um, it, you know, I never expected the business to turn out the way that it did. And, you know, the things that I jo enjoyed doing in the early days, um, I've moved on now and I really enjoy seeing other people come work for us and see them, them do uh, get a job that's really rewarding and let them be creative. So I've started to change on how we do things. We've just bought an old mill, which is 200 years old, and we're going to try and uh, restore it and expand into it. So um, a little bit of a challenge when it's got no roof and it's on the buildings at risk register, it's classed as dilapidated. Um, it's a real challenge, but you know, it's one that now seven years in, I believe we've got the team and we've got the confidence to give it a good go. That, that's great. And do you think that you can grow still? Absolutely. You, you know, um, it was a very difficult year for us last year and um, we were able to add new markets. So uh, we're delighted to be now be distributed in Argentina, Australia and India. Um, but um, as of next week, we'll be distributed in Marks and Spencer, Scotland. So 
we're really pleased. We, we, we found ways to grow um, and we found different products to bring to market. Um, I think we're, we're, we're very optimistic business. I think that optimism always kind of bears fruit. Um, so yeah, I do, I do think there's still space for us to grow and I'm still optimistic. Okay, uh, some more feedback, Martin. Jacqueline Sutherland said, great taster session, it was lovely. And her favorite was the spring edition. And um, I've got one here from Sarah Wilkins. I would like to thank everyone for the brilliant subtitling. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Maybe uh, Claire could type that in, that we read that one out. Uh, Tommy, great talk. Big fan of the refillable pouches. What's that? Oh, yeah. So we were, last year, or two years ago, we were the first gin distillery to do uh, free post, fully recyclable refill pouches. Um, and we, it's been a massive hit. You know, we did it. And I always have this nervousness where when you're the first to do something, it's either a brilliant idea that nobody's thought of, or it's a terrible idea that everybody's discounted. So we did the refill pouches and um, it's been a big hit. We did it as a UK uh, project and it, we now sell refillable pouches into Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Germany. And last year I won the Institute of Directors, uh, Director of the Year for Innovation for that project. So um, it, it turned out okay. <laughs> Oh, well, well done, Martin. You're really putting us on the map. A couple of bit more feedback. Jaden, thank you very much. This was our first gin tasting, and it was wonderful. Yours is the first vodka we've enjoyed. Well done. Uh, Stacy says, thank you for a great presentation. She likes the spring edition. And I've got Jenny Dunnett. Excellent presentation. We'll make note, note of the notes in the future. And the coastal edition is lovely. And uh, that's it. So if there's any other comments or feedback, please um, uh, just come in. Oh, <laughs> Jaden says the grapefruit is wonderful and <laughs> we're excited for the winter edition. Jesus. So uh, that's really good. So I, I've, I've put in a request for a science festival edition next year. Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thanks, Martin. Um, so and to everybody for joining us this evening. Um, and for those of you uh, lucky enough to get a gin tasting Kit. We hope you enjoyed the presentation as much as the gin. Uh, Nicola and Claire uh, volunteered to man this festival, so I've been tasting the gin and enjoying it as you presented it. It's lovely. Um, so thank you, Martin, for the excellent presentation. Good luck with your future uh, ventures. And again, thanks to Ben Ends for providing the gin tasting collection points in Wick and Thurso. We're indebted to you. Uh, tomorrow night, Nicola will be hosting a science team quiz with Ken McElroy from Capus Brock Project. So make sure you sign up for that. And they'll be testing your knowledge on inventions, animals, sci-fi, sci and their top tip is to revise your robots. Uh, on Sunday, we'll be showing Mark Thompson's spectacular science flow. That's for all the family. And I think that's at 11 o'clock. So, um, and the, uh, uh, on Sunday, it's 11 o'clock start. Um, and our final two live events for the festival will take place next week and include a presentation from Dr. Mike Sims about lichens and their importance in the world around us. And I think the final presentation is maths and sport, which will be presented by Dr. Tom Crawford, who will answer questions such as the fastest speed a human will ever run and how to take the perfect penalty kick. So Nicola is looking tired. We're coming to the end of the festival. She's, she told me she'll be sampling the gin immediately after this, Martin. Um, I, th I think, yes, <laughs> two, two, two fingers up. And um, Martin, thanks again. And could I remind everybody, including Mar I think Martin prompted me at the beginning, um, all the talks are being recorded. So uh, they're available for view after it. And there's been some great ones. And the presentations from yesterday, that was Duane, and the one this morning for the aquarium, They'll be online uh, tomorrow, uh, Nicola tells me. And uh, can I ask everybody also uh, to thank Martin, but also Nicola, who's put together a great science festival. So if there's any comments coming up um, in your uh, question and answer, it should be to thank Nicola for putting a great festival on. So with that, um, <laughs> one last comment from Stacey. Um, will you be making more jam donut Jim, Martin. 
you never know. You never. I'll never say no. <laughs> okay. And uh, there's a wee comment from Pat, who of course is our committee member and helps a lot with the festival. Thank you, Pat, for your comments. And uh, uh, Ali says, Nicola, great festival. So with that, I think we'll bow out. Thanks, everybody. Thank you again, Martin. And good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye.